And we're live. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on security narratives for a geopolitical Europe, a panel that I'm glad to moderate. Uh, my name is Bob Dane. I'm a researcher on security and defense here at the Klingendaal Institute, together with my, with my colleague Adasia Stutman, a fellow researcher and also co-author of our work on the strategic compass and on European strategic autonomy. It is our pleasure to moderate this discussion on a topic that is very much close to the heart of what sovereignty really is on security and defense. Now, in previous panels and in the introduction, you've heard that Europe shouldn't only be an economic community, it should also be a social and a cultural community. But you could also argue that Europe is also a security community. And previous speakers have highlighted that the European Union was born and was founded in the aftermath of the Second World War, the ravages of war that tore up the European continent, and that Europe's story is one of overcoming adversity, of overcoming internal divisions and building lasting peace to, in the European continent. It is a beautiful story. And uh, as several speakers have stressed, uh, it is one that we've told for several years. But just now, the State Secretary of Slovenia told us, is this a story that still resonates with future generations? Is this story actually fit for the 21st century? Because Clement Bone in his opening statement highlighted that so far Europe's achievements have largely been in overcoming its internal problems, building an internal market, a currency, and other things. But now its challenges are largely external in nature, migration, climate change, but also increased geopolitical competition. And these are challenges you cannot only solve by insisting on pacifism and on values. European leaders have started to call for a more robust Europe, one that has relearned to speak the language of power. So in a time when others are building up their militaries, when others are flexing their muscles and are letting the guns speak, can Europe afford to be still a community that insists only on the rules-based order on trade, on open societies, and on being the leader of the green world. Can or should Europe have a narrative when it comes to security and defense? And can it even have such a single narrative given the different views between its member states, the different histories that they went through, uh, and the contradictions and the tensions between South and East, or between more assertive countries and more neutral countries? These are all the questions that we're going to discuss with a great panel of speakers whose names you've already seen in the initial uh, clip. I will introduce them later on. Um, we will also give you the floor, audience, those of you who are with us in the Zoom, you have the opportunity of asking questions. And my colleague Adasha will moderate these questions. She will pick them up and distribute them among the panel members. But first, we're going to start with a column because we feel it's helpful sometimes in this type of debates to kickstart these discussions by giving the floor to someone who has written extensively about this, who is here in the room with us, Arnaud Brouwers, the diplomatic correspondent for the Volkskrant. Arnaud is a historian by trade, so he has the advantage of being able to look back. Uh, but he has also studied security studies and American studies. And he shares also my passion for the Russian Federation after having spent many years there as correspondent uh, in Moscow. So Arnaud, I would like to give you the floor first. Uh, having read your writings, they are uh, uh, they're definitely uh, important to also in inject a little bit more energy into the Dutch debate on these topics. But I'd also like to ask you to inject some energy into our panel discussions. Arnaud, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you, Bob. That's a, a tall order, but uh, I will try. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, I mean, good morning listeners. Uh, the topic we discussed today, European defense, uh, I think is a very delicate one. It's precious, it's mysterious. We talk about it endlessly, uh, but we have rarely spotted it in action. A couple of years ago, uh, also at Klingendal, 
I remember an expert saying, more has been achieved in European defense cooperation in the past 20 months than in the 20 years before that. And that excitement had to do with an abbreviation, uh, PESCO, uh, which you all know very well, but which for journalists like myself is quite impossible to explain uh, to their readers. And here we are, after the unilaterally decided withdrawal from Afghanistan and after the AUKUS deal, uh, which makes sense by itself, but which ignores the existence of the EU and betrays one of its largest members. So today, I'm afraid nobody is cheering. Uh, we're discussing the latest wake up call or wake up calls in a long series of wake up calls that basically started with the collapse of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. I mean, tanks roll out of Russian factories faster than chocolate boxes roll out of ours. And while we are in therapy, China has been building a formidable Navy and is openly using terrorist tactics such as hostage taking to get what it wants. So yes, what should be the EU's security narrative? Basically, the question I think is, can we take our own destiny in our own hands? A skeptic might say, obviously not. We prefer the chocolate and there won't be major investments in our defense until a US president in front of our eyes tears up the Washington Treaty uh, and throws it in the bin. And really we came close to it. But as a utopian realist, I'd say, let's hope the EU survives its internal contradictions and returns to the embodiment of democracy and rule of law that many people in the world admire it for. Obviously, replacing or copying US military might is not going to happen. So that's my first point. Let's not be shy in formulating lofty goals, uh, as long as they side go, go along with humility and realism. My second point, our military weakness doesn't necessarily mean that we are weak on the global scene. Weakness is not only a function of military uh, weakness or strength, by the way, is not only a function of military means, but also of economic ones, the capacity for technological innovation, the power to set rules, and last but not least, political cohesion. So if we want a stronger EU on the global stage, honestly speaking, it will require much more than investments in defense. In our quest for a strategic narrative, uh, we must not stray from the EU's self-perception as a different power, one where values actually matter, the birthplace of power politics, but also its bloody graveyard. I like the term strategic autonomy when it signals to autocrats surrounding us that we won't allow them to take us hostage, either with gas deliveries or with threats to unleash refugees. But then look at Nord Stream 2, German unilateralism and naivete wrapped up in a single strategic disaster for Europe. So no, I'm afraid we won't see EU members letting a French president <clears throat> or a German chancellor negotiate their hardcore security interests with Vladimir Putin. It's not going to happen. The AUKUS deal underlines that hardcore national security interests trump everything else, including offending friends. For Australia, the threat perception of China has changed dramatically in the past few years, and that's what made them change their mind. So don't expect Poland or Lithuania <clears throat> to behave differently uh, when push comes to shove. And then there's an even bigger but to the concept of strategic autonomy, the grueling fact that we actually really are dependent on Americans for their military might, their nuclear umbrella, their enablers, and will remain so for quite some time. And if you don't believe me, take it from President Macron, who yesterday sold a defense deal with Greece as not an alternative to the alliance with the US, but about taking responsibility for the European pillar within it. Well spoken, Monsieur le Président. On Twitter this week, uh, you could see a video of two men who climbed high in the trees in a forest because downstairs a tiger was grumbling and almost attacking them. And they just had to sit in the tree 
uh, they had no weapons uh, and they could only hope for the danger to pass or for a third party uh, intervention. Now, to me, that sounds pretty much like Europe's current predicament. And in a situation like that, do you think it would help if those two who were climbing, sitting in the tree, held up a poster to the tiger saying strategic autonomy? I also don't think so. I'm very curious to hear more today in this session about the effort in the EU to devise a strategic compass. And what will Europe use the compass for? That's also an interesting question. To find the tiger or to stay away from it? Um, but back to the narratives. Do we have alternatives to strategic autonomy? Uh, shared security might be a more realistic one, uh, but that doesn't sound very sexy, does it? Basically, European citizens, I feel, uh, seem to want independence from the US. They really want it very badly, uh, but they're not really willing to pay for it. So the narrative of strategic autonomy appeals to this fiction and self-deception, hence its popularity. And really, it does sound better than we want to have our cake and eat it. Personally, I prefer strategic sovereignty, or I think it's even better because it underlines the European right to make its own decisions in global affairs, thinking independently. Nobody can quarrel with that. But let's look at the hard part, acting independently. If you compare present European defense capabilities, and that's the French and British included, to 20 years ago, it's breathtaking. I'm not sure that all European citizens realize just how immense the destruction is. The trend now is upward again, but I think it will take a giant political earthquake to set off the kind of investments needed for strategic autonomy. Does that mean that the EU is weak? Not necessarily. The EU still is a unique experiment in governance. We have instruments, we have elements of a superpower, but just uh, like our strength flow from the pooling of sovereignty, so does our biggest weakness easily spotted and exploited by other powers. Lack of cohesion, lack of purpose, and the increasing fragility of our way of life. Within those limits, we need to define where our common interests lie. This is needed when it comes to our immediate neighbors to the East and South, but also with regard to China. Europeans are skeptical about teaming up with the US against China for understandable reasons. Still, our interests may dictate that in a range of fields is beneficial to teen up vis-a-vis -vis China, just like in others, it may not be. But you need some strategic sovereignty to make those decisions. You need shared security currently expressed in NATO not to be overrun or to be coerced to do things you don't want. The combination of those two notions, I think is about as far as we can go. And will that concept of strategic sovereignty be limited? Of course. It flows from our choices in the past quarter century, including the democratic choice to be militarily weak. There is no quick escape from that, but in order to have more options in 25 years time, you need to change course now. In conclusion, the notion of strategic sovereignty is useful as an expression of European self-respect, but you can worry about the gap between ambitions and capabilities and where those can lead to. It's like in the love song by Simply Red, where they sing, so now we've got our independence. What are we going to do with it? Thank you very much, Ardout. Uh, we knew that you would provoke an interesting discussion and you have not let us down. Thank you for this, uh, for this really important introduction because it creates a very good bridge to our discussion also with the panel members whom I'm sure have taken note attentively in order to respond to you. And who better to start with than uh, Ambassador Joanneke Balfour, uh, Joanneke, you're currently the director of the security and defense policy uh, within the European External Action Service, but you've also had the privilege of uh, representing the Netherlands inside the EU in the political and security committee, but you've also bring the unique opportunity of the American perspective and the British perspective, having served in senior positions, both in Washington and in London. Now, you already saw this one coming, I'm sure, when Arnaud mentioned the strategic compass. Uh, this, this bigger question of can we develop a tool that actually leads all of the European uh, countries into the same direction, or at least thinking along the same lines about things like threat perceptions and follow-up steps. 
Could you enlighten us a little bit on uh, whether or not we can hope the strategic compass serves to do at least a little bit of what Arnaud has asked, namely a common vision on how to get rid of the tiger in case it does come underneath the tree? Joannika, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, and thank you, Arnaud, uh, for uh, uh, your introduction. And whether we can get rid of the tiger, I don't know whether I will be able to, to solve that riddle, but I, I, I do hope we can get another uh, metaphor uh, for the EU as a, a global uh, security actor uh, than uh, the two people in the tree uh, uh, looking at the tiger. But saying that, I think uh, uh, what, what Arna said is of course true. And uh, I don't want to, to sort of diminish uh, what we're doing as the EU, but we have to also take into account that it's quite new that we started to think about the EU as a security actor. Uh, and um, I mean, it started a bit in, in the global strategy 2016. And if you look at the past five years, of course, there is a narrative uh, very clearly out there because the security situation requires from the EU to step up and, and to act more as a global security actor. What does it mean uh, a step up as a global security actor? And what does it mean for our threat perceptions? Like you're saying, this is 27 member states, different histories, different ge geography, and different threat perceptions. But all agreeing that at a certain point, after we agreed on, on the global strategy and to, to, to direct more on the, in the areas of security and defense, to found some acronyms like, uh, like Arnaud has mentioned. I think, I mean, it's not, up to, uh, uh, not enough time for this panel to, to really go into the depth of the PESCO, but PESCO uh, and the European Defense Fund are tools and instruments where we can pool our capacities and work together between member states and companies to really take care of the, the urgent needs of capabilities. And this is one I will get back to, but then on the threat, on the threat perceptions, what we uh, agreed upon with, within the 27 member states that we needed a basis, uh, a threat analysis, where we could base upon where we need to focus on uh, within the security and defense field. And this was uh, done uh, last year for the first time within the European Union, based on input from 27 intelligence services, both military and civilian. And this threat analysis uh, if you read it, well, it's, it's a classified document, but in fact, we can see it around us. Uh, there are the zones of instability, there are the different kinds of threats, there's the cyber, disinfo, climate change, scarcity of resources, but also the global rivalry, the uh, Russia and China and other competitors. So there is a whole range uh, uh, where we, we see this happening and where you really take the, the decision and the decision was taken, we need as an EU, together with partners, of course, and we will get to, to the role of EU and NATO um, also maybe in this panel, but the, the need to step up our efforts in the security and defense field, and I want to emphasize also put emphasis on security because it's not only defense and it's very much, and Arnold mentions this also, the EU to, to act in an integrated way because the EU as such has unique instruments and mm -hmm. we only need to use them uh, geopolitically. And maybe, and we're not there yet. We have not been used to do that. And we have been maybe too much focusing on, on our uh, uh, focus on rule of law, on the rules-based order, on the way uh, 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 other, we hope other nations will also uh, act, but the world is not like that. So what we did after this threat analysis is starting a strategic dialogue with member states. What do we need to do more? Uh, because we've done already a lot. Uh, we are going on the right path on, on security and defense initiatives, but we need to do more and we need to focus. And this whole strategic dialogue phase uh, on what is, what is going to be this strategic compass 
was also a way of getting this convergence mm -hmm. because we had uh, a member states in the di driving seat, member states putting forward proposals, non-papers, workshops. And of course, that's a lot of discussion. Uh, and what is the real action? Uh, yeah. Well, the discussion uh, is also needed to get all those 27 member states a bit on the same line and to get to uh, agreement on what the strategic compass is. Okay. And the strategic compass will be a bit of a combination of strategy and action plan. And we will uh, hopefully uh, adopt it next year um, uh, at the European Council. And uh, um, I mean, I, I will keep it like this yep. for the, the, the answering, you. but uh, on, on the substance, what's going to be in it, uh, we will have a first draft being discussed uh, in November. All right. Now, what I understand of the joint analysis of the threat perception is first, the EU countries have to agree whether or not a tiger is a problem in the first place, if I can, uh, can sum it up that way. Thank you very much. I know there's much more to say about the strategic compass and we have more opportunities. We'll come back to it in, uh, in a moment. But thank you for this first view, because sometimes the process itself of getting to the compass is already valuable. It has intrinsic value in at least leading to what you mentioned, this convergence of narratives. But you see this word coming. We have our colleague Dick Sunday, head of the security unit, who has spent many years dealing with many of the acronyms that, uh, that Arnaud has mentioned. Uh, not only PESCO, but he also worked, among others, for the European Defense Fund, the EDF. Uh, Dick, you have written many things for the Klingendal Institute on the importance of, um, let's say, a, a stronger Europe that can take its destiny in its own hand. But one of the obstacles we've encountered many times along the way is that there is already a security community and it, it's called NATO. And often the question is, what should Europe do uh, if, if a stronger Europe could pose a threat to the transatlantic relationship? We know the, the, the old concerns, but you've done a lot of work on this. Could you uh, share a little bit your thinking with us on how NATO fits into that broader European security narrative, and if it's an either-or or an and-and uh, question. Dick, the floor is yours. Indeed, uh, Bob, and, uh, and thank you very much, uh, because uh, Arnaud talked about the tiger uh, at the bottom of the tree, but there's also still the bear uh, to the east of, uh, of Europe. Uh, and I think that's another security concern we still are having in Europe, and probably at the moment it's more uh, threatening than China because the Chinese uh, challenge is mainly economic at the moment, of course, military, it is growing uh, as well. And that indeed, Bob, brings in uh, NATO. Nobody has mentioned it so far, uh, because we're focusing here the debate, of course, on Europe and the European narrative. But we cannot neglect that the Atlantic Alliance still exists. The treaty has not been thrown into pieces, as Arnaud uh, was suggesting might happen someday. Uh, and with the Biden administration, actually, uh, there is sort of a, a reaffirmment from the United States uh, on uh, supporting European security in case of. Now, having said that, of course, that implies also that the Americans demand from the Europeans that they do more. And here's exactly what comes in the combination of strengthening NATO and also allowing Europe to act on its own when that is uh, needed. So this is where I see an important part of the narrative. Uh, not just focus on what Europe, which, by the way, is something different than the EU, uh, because Europe is more than the EU, should be able to do, uh, but also uh, how that connects to strengthening the uh, allied security, uh, strengthening uh, uh, NATO. Now, there is already, in fact, de facto a division of labor between NATO and the European Union. And uh, NATO has returned to its core Article 5 task of collective defense, since the Wales Summit in 2014, it has started to strengthen its deterrence and defense posture. There is still a lot more to be done, uh, but important steps have been taken, and the Americans are still uh, in Europe. In fact, even under Trump, the American presence in Europe was strengthened a little bit, not in considerable numbers, uh, but it was not less. It was, in the end, more. Um, at the same time, we have seen the EU developing, of course, its treaty-based task of crisis management, uh, using the whole panoply of instruments. Joanneke referred rightly to the integrated approach, but including the military elements, small-scale, not large-scale operations, and increasingly uh, training assistance, post-conflict uh, stability type of missions. But indeed, it has been doing uh, that. 
So in terms of the narrative, there you see another element that is NATO is the organization still responsible for collective defense against the big enemy to the east and perhaps one day China uh, as well. And while for stability, prosperity uh, and promoting the rule of law and democracy in the neighborhood of Europe, and particularly in the southern area, of course, the EU will be more and more uh, in the lead. This is another element that could be part of the, of, uh, the narrative. Um, but Arnold is absolutely right that even for that limited narrative of promoting stability uh, and uh, 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 prosperity uh, in uh, our neighborhood, we need to beef up the military elements and uh, not to speak of a global role uh, in military uh, terms. So this is indeed what is still needed. I'm a little bit less pessimistic uh, than uh, he is because I do see a lot of improvement over the last four or five years with all the instruments Ionica has referred to, the instruments are there. But what still is lacking, uh, and here I will conclude, I think is enough political will to sustain this effort because we have been doing it for a couple of years. Now, do we sustain it for another 10 to 20 years? Because that will be absolutely necessary. And secondly, are we prepared to give up the national sovereignty to transfer power to a European level. Uh, and, and there I mean uh, sovereignty over your armed forces as well. Now, the first steps to be taken is integration of armed forces. There are good examples how it can be done. Uh, but of course, it is a way too big step to move from uh, point A to B to transferring all the authority to Europe. So we have to do this uh, step by step. If we continue that with high level political support, so here also the European Council comes in as a very important political high level body, I think, to steer this process. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was five, six years uh, ago. But uh, I do share uh, the bleak picture of Arnaud. There is still a lot to be done and uh, it can derail very quickly. Yep. Thank you very much, Dick, also for attracting our attention to that decision-making question and the transfer of sovereignty. Because if you really want to have a European narrative when it comes to security, while everybody holds on to, as Arnaud pointed out, their national security and national sovereignty, first of all, uh, then it's pretty hard to pool those resources in a meaningful uh, way. Now, you also mentioned the importance of the European Council and political will. Uh, there is one country that has an outsized impact on this, uh, rightfully also so, but that has been traditionally relatively modest. So where it is the French that are pushing the agenda with far-reaching ideals and visions, it is often Germany that then afterwards negotiates a compromise within the European Union. And I'm very happy that we have with us from Berlin, Jana Puglierin, who is the head of the ECFR office in Berlin, uh, who has done the last couple of days, I think nothing else except speaking about the impact of the German elections on European peace and security. Uh, Jana, you were previously also with, uh, with the DGAP, the German Council for Foreign Relations. Uh, and I think we can be very lucky to have you with us very briefly after these elections to reflect a little bit to the extent that you already can, of course, with coalition formation being a, being a big question. Uh, we know everything about coalition formation in the Netherlands. It can take ages. Uh, please beat us to it, I would say. Um, but what do you think we can expect? Because Germany has traditionally been uh, careful before proceeding, but some of the candidates have had further reaching visions of what they would like when it comes to European security and defense. So we're all ears, Jana. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Actually, we call what happened in Germany the Netherlandization of German politics. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, I don't I'm know sorry. If that's a good thing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Germany and defense. It, it is difficult, as you mentioned, because there is no new coalition in place. The negotiations have just started. And maybe, uh, kind of, I'm leaning myself a bit too much out of the window here, but I'll. I'll take the guess that we will see a traffic light coalition. That means uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, the SPD um, in the lead, um, together with the Greens and the Liberals. Because just today, this is the most likely scenario. But I, I mean, it can always uh, change rapidly, as we've seen last time in 2017. But I think this is also actually the more interesting scenario when it comes to, to European defense. So let's stick with that for, for a moment. Um, I think. Um, all those three parties would be less fearful to antagonize the United States um, and more open to embrace this narrative of European sovereignty. I mean, we call it always capacity to act. Um, we prefer that over strategic autonomy or European sovereignty. Um, but 
I see kind of um, the candidates um, like Annalena Baerbock and also Olaf Scholz, I mean, not cutting ties with uh, the United States, uh, that should not, the kind of the European angle should not come as the at the expense of the transatlantic angle, um, but still both parties and also the FTP have um, emphasized the need for to do more on the European slash the EU level uh, more particularly. And I think in the CDU is traditionally more skeptical, especially under this defense minister, we saw kind of a shift from von der Leyen to AKK, kind of a reorientation from kind of a focus on the EU to again, a stronger focus on NATO. But I mean, the German narrative here would be this one doesn't, um, can, one shouldn't harm the other. And these are basically two tracks we need to, to follow. So more commitment um, on the EU level. All three parties have expressed sympathies for a European army, for example, um, and for deeper integration also when it comes to decision making. Um, so that's all very positive. Where I'm a bit skeptical, though, is, and that brings me uh, to Arno's uh, introductory remarks um, when he said, yeah, there is a lot of commitment in uh, rhetoric, but when it comes to backing this up with the necessary means uh, and the money, here I think the problem starts. And here my worries are actually bigger with a traffic light coalition than they would be under a Jamaica coalition. Because in recent years, it was, um, I mean, we, of course, we haven't reached the 2%, but you have seen some changes um, in Germany and the, the CDU and the CSU have been pushing very hard for this to happen. The FDP as well, but this is the first issue with the new uh, government defense spending, the 2% commitment, the SPD and the Greens are very skeptical that this is helpful. Um, in the past, we have heard uh, the SPD talking about uh, the fear of the militarization of Europe. And so... There I see problems uh, because the FDP, I mean, is committed, but it's also the smallest coalition party. Another uh, stumbling block for, for more uh, European cooperation would be um, arms exports. Um, under this new coalition, the FDP would be more open and flexible, also more um, accommodating, I think, with uh, in light of the French positions. Um, but the Greens and the SPD, for them, this is a very tough topic um, and a, cop a topic that is very dear to kind of green identity. So it's not a, a side issue. It goes to the heart of the green and also increasingly the SPD identity. So the stricter regulations on arms exports that would uh, impact, of course, uh, joint armament projects. I don't know if you've watched closely the SPD position on FCAS. I mean, in the grand coalition and the problems um, we made. So um, we had, so yeah, I think it will be difficult um, for this new coalition, for example, FCAS, also for the Greens, because um, of the technology um, aspect to it, because it uh, implies autonomous weapon systems, which the Greens are very skeptical about. And also, um, it should maybe carry one day kind of nuclear, uh, like French nuclear weapons in the, in the future. All this is for the Greens, at least difficult to swallow. So, and that brings me yeah, to autonomous weapon systems uh, more broadly. I mean, we don't even have a military AI strategy in Germany. I don't see that. I don't see a lot of appetite um, to touch uh, or to, to, to deal with all these big topics like um, armed drones. And, and also, please don't forget that the, the European Defense Fund, as it is, for example, was opposed by the Greens um, because um, kind of the, the legislation was not strict enough, kind of what projects get the funding and all this. Um, same with the Euro drone. Um, so there is what, what I what I'm just afraid of is this huge gap between commitment um, and yeah, kind of projects beyond the horizon, like the European army, but the very concrete kind of day to day um, projects that 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 they will suffer and kind of not immediately related to EU defense, but more broadly, um, what is interesting to watch, I think, is the new government's positioning on nuclear sharing, mm -hmm. which is my um, biggest worry personally, um, because here again, the FDP, I think, is uh, would be the party who would argue in favor um, of this. And I think Olaf Scholz knows about the importance of NATO and Annalena Baerbock too, but all kind of Annalena Baerbock has basically 
because she thought it will be a black green um, coalition. They had opened basically windows to make compromises with the conservatives because the, for the conservatives, this would have been a very important topic in the um, negotiations uh, when it comes to a coalition treaty. But now my fear is that you, you have the SPD and the Greens and nobody wants to leave the nuclear sharing arrangement uh, from the leadership, but also you don't have a party that really pushes for it. And that, that kind of gives you something. And it's not the hill that the FDP wants to die on. And this is a huge procurement decision with the successor plan for the tornado. So this government in theory should take a super expensive kind of million euro decision that would also um, kind of somewhat um, make it possible to have this nuclear sharing arrangement in place for a longer period. And here, biggest yeah. worry. I can and that's see for that. <laughs> uh, no, thanks a lot, Jan. And I know there's a lot more to say uh, on, on Germany's role, but what I gather from your first impressions, and first of all, thanks, because as an analyst giving forecasts, uh, and thanks for leaning out of the window that you think the Ampel or the, the traffic light coalition is more likely. Uh, but I can imagine this also uh, generates some uh, questions within our own Dutch Ministry of Defense, which gives me a good chance to go to our last speaker, uh, Sander van der Sluis, uh, who is the head of the EU defense policy section within our defense ministry, but also has a background in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in multilateral uh, cooperation. Now, Sander, you are actually someone who is in the trenches, who has to sit in all these working groups in Brussels. You're actually experiencing this up close. And within the defense ministry, you're also experiencing the very, I would say, fair frustration among the armed forces that, you know, uh, people like us, the journalists and the think tankers, we'd like to put big narratives on the map. Uh, but in the meanwhile, uh, the defense ministry has to make do with the uh, Netherlands, where we have more chocolate being produced than tanks, let's, uh, let's put it like that. We don't even have uh, the tanks anymore unless we cooperate with, uh, with Germany, actually. Now, Sander, uh, when you listen to this, when you listen to Arnaud, and when you listen also to what Jana was saying, what might come out of, of Germany, uh, and knowing that you've just uh, published the defense vision within the defense ministry, what are your thoughts on the chances of this emergence of a European narrative, and more importantly, being able to act on such a narrative? The floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks for, for the invitation. And I've been listening uh, eagerly to, to all the previous uh, speakers. Uh, but like you asked, let me provide some uh, Dutch perspective uh, to the discussion and where the government uh, stands. Although we, as you know, have a caretaker government in the Netherlands. Uh, we do have a, a policy line that, uh, that we are working with. And I think what's interesting maybe to, to share with, uh, with the other speakers in the audience is that our position on EU defense has shifted in the last couple of years. Traditionally, the Netherlands has been very much focused on NATO. Uh, we are one of the most transatlantic uh, countries in the EU, still are. Uh, but in the last couple of years, due to uh, what happened previously in the US, due to Brexit, due to a changing threat um, perception, we have become more ambitious on EU defense policy as well. So we like to talk about the and and policy, having both a strong EU and a strong NATO. And that has been a shift in the, the last couple of years compared to the previous uh, decades. Uh, and this is also noticeable within the Ministry of Defense, uh, which is becoming more and more EU minded. Um, and of course, like you said, the basis of this is in the uh, Defence Vision 2035 that was uh, sent to Parliament by our, our previous Defence Minister, Bailevitt. Now, Arnaud talked about the, uh, the people in the tree and the tiger and uh, just showing the poster with strategic autonomy. Uh, I think we, have, we don't have a bazooka to shoot the, the tiger as an EU. But we do have more uh, than Arnaud might uh, think. And of course, those acronyms don't help. But behind those acronyms are, in fact, quite a bit of uh, instruments and uh, stuff that we can use from that tree. Uh, and the Netherlands has been supporting the development of those instruments. Joanne already mentioned a couple. Um, one that is maybe most striking is the European Defence Fund of 8 billion euros, which is 
new and which is starting this year and which will help uh, European countries and defense industries to work more closely together and to develop defense cap capabilities together. Uh, so we're just at the start of this. PESCO, Permanent Structured Cooperation, is another one that was mentioned. Behind this acronym are about 50 concrete projects in which member states are cooperating. One of them is a, a rapid cyber response team led by Lithuania that the Netherlands is participating in. And we had a successful exercise uh, uh, this year. Uh, another one is uh, the capability to do uh, on uh, anti-mining within the Navy. Another one is developing European Medical Command. I won't give you the whole list, but just to make the point that behind the acronyms are in fact lots of projects going on. Uh, another one is the European Peace Facility that will allow our EU missions not only to train, but also to equip, which will be new. Uh, we are developing a EU military headquarters, which is already there, but will grow in the years to come. And there is now talk of uh, changing, developing the current EU battle groups into an EU initial entry force of mm -hmm. 5,000 uh, soldiers. So these are all developments that are on the table that the Netherlands is supporting. Now, perhaps on um, the point of what you mentioned, Bob, uh, the, 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 the ways that means, <clears throat> uh, I think it was quite striking that a couple of months ago, the commanders of the army, the Navy, the Air Force jointly came out in a joint interview in, the, in a Dutch newspaper, actually making the point that um, we do lack resources. And so it was a sort of clear statement that they made, also supported by the minister, that we in fact need 4 billion euros extra in order to do our job in the EU and NATO. So that message has been sent clearly. Uh, and it's up to the, the new government to see what, uh, what, what they will do with it. And then maybe a last point on strategic autonomy. Um, I like the way that Jana defined it, uh, the capability to act uh, independently if necessary and together with partners when possible. Um, and in this whole discussion, the Dutch perspective is leaning more towards an outward looking approach because uh, I think with it, when you talk about strategic autonomy, the, some countries have the tendency to look inwards uh, and to emphasize uh, that we all should do it within Europe. And of course, we should do more within Europe, but we should also keep our pers perspective outwards, uh, the, the US, the UK. And we are actually taking concrete steps to, 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 uh, to do something on that as well. One example is that, uh, here it comes again, PESCO project. Mm -hmm on military mobility that the Netherlands is leading. And um, we will actually uh, allow the United States, Canada and Norway into that project in the course of this uh, autumn. And that will be the first time yeah. that such an EU project will uh, allow third countries to join. Thank you, uh, Sander, also for naming that example, because uh, we've heard at the beginning of the conference, Minister De Bruyne also arguing for open strategic autonomy. So not a closed protectionist version of it, but an open one. And of course, we've just seen also the Dutch prime minister going to the UK, in, among others, to also speak about a defense matter. So we are still, you know, not only focusing on, on European Union, as also Dick emphasized. But now uh, our listeners have been very patiently waiting, but they might already have asked some questions. I can't see them, but my colleague Adasha is here uh, behind the laptop. She has all the questions in front of her. Adasha, can you uh, uh, share with us some of the things the audience might want to know? Yes, thank you, Bob. Uh, the, already, uh, the audience already indeed raised a few very interesting questions. I will start with a more general one. Okay. Um, in the discussion so far, we have touched upon the steps that have been made when it comes to European defense. Uh, but as Arnaud already noted in his opening column, uh, it is often difficult to explain what is being done and what the various defense initiatives entail. Uh, this also came forward in one of the questions that was put forward by uh, Tom van Os. Uh, but if we cannot explain what these various defense initiatives entail, then maybe we are not that successful. How can we generate uh, clear messages on European defense initiatives to convince the public and make them understand the purpose and benefits of European defense? 
Wow, that's uh, indeed a very good one, because the things that Joannek and Sander mentioned, they are actually far reaching things that are happening in military mobility for making it easier to stuff for stuff to get from west to east. And uh, but we are not really telling that story at a global European level. Maybe our citizens don't really follow this, uh, these matters. Joannek, I think I'd like to give this question to you, uh, because I know that the EAS worries also about you know, strategic communication and, and things like that. Uh, is it maybe not known enough, all these many things that we actually do achieve? Well, thank you. No, I, I think indeed uh, 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 strategic communication is an issue and, and uh, what kind of narrative and what we communicate about uh, all those new initiatives is important. And, and maybe indeed we don't do a, a, a good job yet because also uh, uh, this is not always easy to communicate um, because in general, and this is maybe a bit um, easy to say for me, but defense projects take time uh, and uh, uh, developing capabilities takes time. But in general, I think the narrative is that we need to have more capabilities, more resources and what we do and what we try to do with this new defense initiatives is get the European countries to work together on those capabilities. And this is what and Sander explained a bit also, what's happening with PESCO projects, uh, where, for example, the Netherlands has been very active already pre-PESCO in working together uh, with Germany and uh, with uh, uh, the Navy in, in, in Belgium. And so some EU countries have experience to work together, but a lot didn't have because it's up till now, a very sovereign part is, is your own defense. And what we did with the PESCO is get countries to work together. Um, Sander mentioned uh, the cyber weapon uh, teams. There is training centers. Uh, there is uh, uh, military mobility, the mind countermeasures, there are 46 different kind of projects where countries work together to look where they can uh, share and, and, and do uh, uh, exercise, set up uh, collaborative projects. Funded sometimes also with the European Defence Fund, which is very new, which started now, which is meant also to get industries in different countries to work together. Uh, and this is also a, a new pilot because in defense industries weren't used to work together on, on those issues. And, and I want to mention the emphasis also within the European Defense Fund on new technologies. This is all new. And uh, uh, so these are, uh, the concrete projects are there. The communication is something indeed, I think uh, we have to step up to really explain Sometimes it really we need to go back to the whole idea of, 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 of this, this picture of the, the, the two types of tanks that the US deploys and the, I don't know how many different yeah. types of tanks uh, the EU has. Uh, and they, this is not effective and we can pool and then we can get more capabilities for less money. So not only do we produce more chocolate than tanks, to quote Arnaud, but also we produce so many different types of tanks uh, that makes it even harder. Now, Dick, I know that you are one of the people who knows very well how long defense projects take, but you also know, have this, this point that we maybe don't speak about European security and defense enough, not only because it's complex, but also because it's very sensitive and comes close to matters of sovereignty and explaining it to domestic audiences. I saw you wanted to follow up, so the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I don't think the EU is very good in, in um, showing results and in explaining uh, uh, all the difficult uh, acronyms. But I also doubt if the solution uh, is lying there to get more support and political sustained uh, investment. I think what is missing in Europe is a leading political class that explains when they come back to Brussels what they have achieved in the positive way instead of explaining what has not been reached and are the lines where member states do not agree. Um, if they do that, and if they do it in the terms of security and defense consistently on three items, it is consistently pointing to the complex threats we are facing in Europe, which sometimes are neglected, or they just point to one, like they point in Eastern Europe to Russia, 
and in Southern Europe, they point only to the Sahel area, um, then we're not building a community of a threat analysis, which is completely shared, because I do agree with Jonneke that we do have a common threat analysis, but everything is in there, and there is no prioritization within that. Secondly, uh, if they transmit the message consistently that we have to invest on a sustained way, as I said before, into the next two decades together, and thirdly, uh, we have to integrate our armed forces more. I think that is a story the average European citizen will understand. Every poll is showing that there is huge support in Europe for taking more responsibility for its own security and that it needs more working together in Europe in terms of defense apparatuses and armed forces coming uh, together. Uh, and we will not buy in, I think, that support uh, on a sustained level by explaining more how the EDF works or how PESCO works or whatever. This is not what the average citizen is looking at. This is for sort of the experts and the people in parliament and so forth. So the narrative should be at a higher level. Uh, and that, that all comes down to the political leadership explaining the benefits of working together in Europe instead of explaining that we can do it better nationally, which is not the case. We cannot do it and afford it anymore nationally. Now, Jana, you've just watched a group of German politicians trying to tell this story, but in different ways to, to their respective electorates. I saw you wanted to add, so uh, please go ahead. Um, first, I, I wholeheartedly disagree that politicians in Germany tried to explain this uh, to their electorate. Uh, they didn't do this at all uh, in this election campaign. It was a okay. non-issue, a non-topic, <laughs> which, which was, uh, I regretted that very much. It was painful to watch. But mm. what I wanted to make, what I think is the devil, uh, kind of in, in everything or kind of the, the, the elephant in the room here is that it is pretty difficult to convince the public that this is all leading to, uh, I don't know, progress if the things that we do actually don't make such a difference when looking at the real hard questions. So for example, I think what's really um, sticking with people is uh, Afghanistan, the evacuation, the Europeans that are unable to, uh, yeah, to evacuate their own people, this complete dependency on, on the United States uh, capabilities. I think that's what shapes the narrative. What shapes the narrative is that uh, in EUTM Mali uh, soldiers that we had trained and equipped kind of have uh, staged two coups so far. That's what uh, kind of what's the narrative. Um, or that, I mean, I have actually heard so many German soldiers ridicule what we do with uh, within Operation Irini and that kind of what we do is completely not what we should do um, actually and that that it's uh, a, a kind of a waste of resources. That's what I have heard, heard from the military here. Um, and then look at the PESCO projects. I mean, some of them like military mobility are really great, but I mean, there is still this diving school, for example. How can I explain uh, the audience out there that there are huge threats, but my answer can one of the PESCO projects is a diving school. So I think that really takes some courage from a politician to do. And I think the trick is, and I mean, I'm preaching to the converted here and I know this, but I mean, we need to start doing things that actually make a difference when it really matters. Yeah. No, thank you for that uh, uh, call for urgency, uh, almost. Uh, Adash, have you got more of these good questions stored up that, uh, that trigger a good debate? Yeah, well, maybe closely related to what has just been discussed is the issue of political will, because how mm -hmm. can we explain something that we are not sure of that we even want to? Mm -hmm. So uh, this actually combines two questions by Laura van Schoonerwald and Jan Scholte. And the question is uh, to all of the panelists, do you see any opportunity to... Uh, to, that the lack of political will can be overcome in the nearby future? Or will it be the case that more neutral and non-aligned states uh, prevent this from happening? And how can we convince them to contribute more and invest more in defense investments? Okay, now, that's a good one. Now, uh, quiet was the last round, Sander. So Sander, this one's coming to you first, because I know that you sit there in working groups, and we haven't touched upon this yet, with countries, some of which have defense opt-outs, like Denmark, and some of them are very much attached to their neutrality, uh, like Ireland. And you still have to reach uh, agreements with them. And Joanneke has also had this pleasure of to negotiate this. Uh, could you uh, maybe have a stab at this question first? Sure. Uh, and it's a central question, I think. Um, before I wrote down, uh, when we talked about the means and the financing, <clears throat> had the willingness to pay, which Arnold also mentioned, but also the willingness to play, uh, which is all about political will and to get into the action mode when, when needed. 
<clears throat> and um, what we've seen, I think, in the in the the last couple of years is. Uh, the uh, European countries not, well, of course there are EU missions and operations, but we've, when, it, when they are more robust, we see more ad hoc uh, coalitions operating, uh, fighting ISIS or uh, the, the maritime mission in the, uh, the, the Gulf of Hormuz, uh, EMASO. Um, <clears throat> so um, one of the ideas currently being discussed also in the framework of the strategic compass and also pushed by Germany, in fact, is uh, the possibility of coalitions of the willing mm. within the EU using Article 44 of the EU treaty. I hope I'm not get, becoming too technocratic uh, here, but it's actually a possibility in the EU treaty for countries that want to get into action uh, with a certain operation to actually do so under the EU flag um, and although you would still need a unanimous decision by the council, that's not taken away for the moment, uh, the actual operation and the headquarters and the way of running the operation would be in fact something uh, for those countries running the, the show. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that is being looked into. Uh, I don't think it will be the magic wand that will solve everything, but I think it was worth mentioning this um, development in uh, in response to, the, to this question on political will. Yeah, no, thank you, Sander, because that means Article 44 would allow indeed missions to take place without everybody having to agree and on, on contributing to it, which is a way around that paralyzing consensus principle that actually reigns supreme when it comes to security and defense, also due to, due to the treaties. I'm taking this as a complete answer because I haven't seen any other hands go up, so I'm going to ask Adasha if there's uh, there's more of them. Yes, there is another question, uh, which is closely to re related to something Arnau touched upon in the beginning. Uh, in the past decades, defense investments have gone down significantly, significantly, but we have seen in the past few years that defensive investments have gone up again. But uh, we are currently facing a new challenge, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this relates to a question that is being posed by Laura Ostam. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought about economic problems for various countries, but at the same time, there are multiple large issues that Europe needs to address. Examples include climate change, the economic buildup after the shock of the pandemic, and migration. But what are the expectations on how this will affect the available financial resources for defense investment? Is there a risk that defense gets pushed off the political agenda? Yeah. A very uh, important question. We've been worried about this for some time, indeed, that you see a crowding out effect. But, uh, Joannica, you raised your hand on this, so I hope you can help us answer this question. No, I, I think it's a very important question, um, uh, because this is at the heart, uh, and it also touches on the previous question about the political will. Uh, because I think, in, 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 in essence, we can, as an EU institution, try to get all the member states together to, to agree on whatever actions, but they, those actions need to be implemented. And so this is also has to do with the resources and the defense investments. And unfortunately, this has been really uh, going down and uh, there is this, uh, 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 all these wake up calls, but we still need a huge defensive investment. And if you even look at uh, the Netherlands, really, I do hope a new government like Sander says, uh, will uh, uh, realize this and will, will respond to, to this lack of defense uh, resources. But we need also the public opinion, of, of course, to, to support this. And there are uh, in the question, all these other challenges uh, and all these other uh, 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 things that are happening and which, which need us. One of those is to work together. So the mm -hmm. need to step up what I just said in my previous uh, answer in, in, in working together with, with uh, nations. The other is use the uh, uh, available tools that we set up, which is the defense initiative, uh, the, the defense funds uh, work together within PESCO projects to pool. Uh, but also realize that we need to do more. And Afghanistan is 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 an example. Uh, Jana already mentioned 
which really think either there were there was a, meet, a meeting of ministers of defense that really uh, and, and even the, the the countries like Ireland and Austria were realizing yes indeed where could we in in a crisis operate as an EU because mm -hmm. at present if you look at our military headquarter uh, that we want to expand it's 49 planners we can't do an operation uh, in securing an airport. We don't it's have enough uh, uh, strategic airlift, but we have. There are some new projects on the strategic airlift, and those uh, this uh, strategic transport was indeed used uh, uh, by European uh, uh, countries in in the evacuation. So, if yep. we put indeed our resources and political will together, maybe we can get there. Okay. No, and of course, it was heartening, as another speaker said, that in the multi-annual financial framework, money was actually given to the more commission level, right, to the EDF. That there is now EU money, not only national money, going to this. Uh, Jana, you already. It could have been more. It could it, have been more. It could have been more. We I even think, wrote uh, something about this. One of the, there were too many member states, and the Netherlands was one of them that wanted to have uh, uh, yeah. less money for the EU budget. Of yeah, because that is the harsh reality of the finance ministers who eventually start squeezing and, uh, and you know, have to cut somewhere. Jana, is that, uh, well, you already mentioned the coalition talks and, and the, the willingness to spend. Uh, do you have also an opinion on the what COVID would mean for that? The amounts of money that have gone into these repair or uh, payments also to keep the industry and, and businesses afloat? Yeah, I think this will be a very difficult question for the EU uh, to take on. And there is uh, a precedent to this because um, actually when we look at the financial crisis and the aftermath of it, um, we saw what not to do now because um, back, back then um, in the financial crisis, every single EU country has made some su substantive cuts um, but they were not coordinated. And uh, what was the result was, um, as my former colleague Christian Mölling always used to say, um, bonsai armies in Europe, 27 European bonsai armies. And I think he has a point. And so um, that's, I think, um, what needs to be avoided now. So if there are cuts uh, that need to be uh, made, maybe kind of coordinate them better. Um, that is, that is, I think, a lesson we should absolutely take. And the other um, thing is maybe that also we should maybe look at this related to other debates right now in Europe. For example, the question about the stability and growth pact mm -hmm. and whether we make it possible uh, for member states to um, take on more debt or whether we think of, for example, the EU um, next gen uh, as a role model for uh, kind of joint investments in the future. So I think it doesn't help us if we treat this question in isolation, but I mean, the money needs to come somewhere. Yeah. And some people are pushing for the idea to allow more flexibility in order to give more leeway for countries, also to invest in defense. Yeah. Thank you. I think you've actually made one of the points that Dick wants to make, or at least that he has consistently made since the COVID crisis started. But Dick, you've also done on that other part of the question, the narrative, right, the way it has to be explained to people and their willingness to invest. You've also done opinion research within the Netherlands uh, on the willingness of people to actually spend money on defense. So maybe uh, I saw you lowered your hand, but maybe you can still add a couple points on that. Yeah, well, I mean, there is always a difference between asking a question, do you want to spend more on security and defense? An overwhelming majority will say yes. But if you put a list in front of them, what are your priorities? And you have health and education uh, and security in the neighborhood. Uh, also in the list, defense ends up number six, seven, eight or nine. Yeah. Um, so we have to be careful with drawing conclusions uh, from, from that. But I want to make two points on the issue of the, 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 the future of defense budgets, because there is a tendency, I think, to look back at what happened 2008 to 2010 and the five following years and sort of add the danger of repeating uh, this in the 2020s. But I think the situation is completely different now. Uh, the argument already mentioned by Jana is first that we have extremely low rent. So spending at the moment is more the motto than cutting uh, on government spending. And you see that across Europe, you see that the European uh, Investment Bank and the European uh, other institutions doing, doing the same. And you see it in a lot of national governments 
uh, proposals uh, as well. So the danger is from that perspective a lot less financially driven than it was 10, 12 years ago. The second thing I think is that in 2010, most of the European leaders didn't bother a lot about security. Uh, we had had Georgia in 2000, but that was far away and it was nothing serious. Since then, we have had the Crimea, we have had the Islamic State, the rise of China, Russia going on with its assertive, to say, diplomatically behavior uh, in the Crimea and surrounding areas, the Donbas and so forth. So there is an awareness that security has become way more important than it was around 2010. That also makes me a bit more optimistic that not only from the financial side, but also from the political side, there is more willingness now to have a sustained increase of defense budget. Now, it will never be what defense ministers want. Uh, because they always want more uh, and the military always want more. So in the end, you have to bring it in balance with, with the other government's spending. Also at the European level, same problem. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was, uh, you know, compared to 10 years uh, ago. Thank you, uh, Dick. Sander, I see you want to take the floor, but we have one more question and 10 minutes. And I'd like to give Arnaud the chance to, um, uh, to make some concluding remarks. So Adasha, if you can ask one question to a specific yes. panelist, maybe. Uh, well, this is a question on EU and NATO, which is something we haven't touched upon yet in the Q&A, mm -hmm. so I thought that would be good. Yep. Um, Dick talked about the division of labor between EU and NATO, but there's also a, a, a difference between how we approach things in NATO and how we approach things in the EU. And this relates to a question uh, of Hugo Klein. Uh, NATO's decision making is consensual. And in NATO, we do not talk about a NATO army. Why is it the case that in the EU context, we always talk about transferring sovereignty mm -hmm. as opposed to consensual decision making and about a European army, which we do not in NATO? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one, because sometimes we, when you talk about an alliance, you don't really think the alliance needs its own army, right? Because it's a cluster of armies. Uh, Sander, I see you nodding, and I just deprived you of the floor on the last one, which means this question is coming to you, because we had the pleasure of sitting on the MFA side of the, of the story as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, this, this often pops up, the idea of the European army, and uh, like Jana said, it is even mentioned in the election programs of German parties. Uh, in the Netherlands, we would we prefer to to stay away from the whole notion of European army because uh, we usually say that there isn't a NATO army either. We do have EU missions and operations. There's no secret about that, uh, which are up and running, uh, and uh, we are in favour of making them more robust. But these are uh, EU military operations in which uh, EU member states provide uh, military on which they decide together. Like I said, uh, unanimously, but possibly in the future, also coalitions of the willing. So that will be my short response. And in terms of division of labor, uh, it's clear that NATO is the one for collective defense. Uh, there, there isn't much debate about that either in the EU. I think most member states agree on that. Uh, what, what we do see now is that both NATO and the EU are getting more ambitions and are developing plans in the area of resilience. Uh, you see it in the discussion on the strategic compass. You see it in the discussion on the strategic concept at the NATO side. Uh, and then you talk about hybrid threats, about cyber disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. So there, I think it would be good if the EU and NATO get together and uh, talk about part, partly division of labor, but also cooperation, how they can work together. And this EU-NATO cooperation is something that the Netherlands together with Germany has been pushing quite hard. Um, and let me also make the point that I wanted to make to sure. agree with what Dick said before about uh, sort of the gaining of political momentum at the EU level, also at leaders level. Uh, we have an informal European summit coming up next week on the 5th of October. They will have a dinner talking about Europe in the world. Uh, most likely AUKUS will be discussed. Uh, I think a couple of words will be said in European defense. We are facing an upcoming French presidency. Uh, we will have a new government, like Jana said, who will, in, in any case, on the rhetoric level, we will be more pro-European. Uh, we have a European Commission president that in the State of, a, of the Union announced a, a European Defence Summit. And mm. we also have a European uh, a, a chair, uh, president of the European Council, Michel, 
who uh, reiterated what Johanneke said, that uh, defense will be on the agenda of the European Council in March. So on the level of uh, leaders, this is clearly becoming uh, uh, stronger and more clearer on their agenda. And that, that is a hopeful development. No, absolutely. And then next year will be one to watch because not only will the strategic compass that Juanica already mentioned be published and indeed that European Defense Summit, but also NATO is coming with its strategic concept, right? Now, and maybe just to come back to Hugo's question on why people think there should be a European army, but not a NATO army. Maybe if I can jump out of moderator and answering role, it's maybe because people expect almost more from the EU as being a supranational entity. Uh, so they, they would think that if it has a common currency, it has a common market, maybe it should also have a common army. While as NATO is seen as a traditional alliance, if you will, where countries have promised to come to each other's aid, but they don't actually need to have one army. They can do so with multiple armies. I don't know, Hugo, if that answers your question, but otherwise you know very well where to, uh, where to find me. Uh, I would like to come to the conclusion of this event by giving Arnaud, who actually kicked off this whole thing, uh, not only with the metaphors of the chocolates, the tanks, the tigers, and the trees, but also with many other uh, important points that I hope you had some answers to or some reflections on. Uh, but it wouldn't be fair to end this without giving you the final say on reflecting back. Arnaud. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting debate. Uh, if, if I might come back to the tiger, just one second. Once more. Because it was, it was explained, uh, I think, as a Chinese tiger or something. But this uh, clip on Twitter actually was uh, deeply in the Siberian forests. So except <laughs> tigers, they definitely also bears around. Uh, so no, no worry about that. Um, I think this debate is really interesting because it shows a kind of a parallel reality uh, in, in this debate about European defense. Uh, people like Johanneke and Sander, they are actually working uh, uh, sort of uh, in, in the forefront uh, on this issue, uh, and they describe uh, real progress, mm. uh, which, which really exists. Um, but on the other hand, I very much understand Jana's remark that uh, you're not going to convince a European audience that such a thing as progress in this field exists if at crucial moments, such as in Afghanistan, or uh, th th there can be other examples, um, it's nowhere to be seen. Uh, so this is a real, mm. uh, you know, of course, it's important to have a good communication strategy. And, and, and uh, I have a renewed faith in, uh, in uh, EU acronyms. So Sander, I also take that home, mm -hmm. uh, but, but Jana's point is very important, uh, uh, you know, in order to convince your, your citizens, uh, you need to show uh, what you're worth on the ground. Uh, and, and that will take some time. I think everybody here agrees on that, but it's a, it's a parallel reality. And uh, um, uh, another thing that I take away from this is that as, so, as somebody who tries to simply understand what's happening or analyze what's happening, I'm also looking at sort of Europe itself, European countries. Uh, I think we experience a, a sort of a crisis in, in politics, a crisis in our democracies. Uh, Trumpism is not an exclusive uh, American phenomenon. And I think all those things that are also at play within the European Union, they also affect uh, topics like the one we discussed mm -hmm. today. Uh, and they can also undermine it or they can hold it back. Uh, uh, and uh, that's uh, something else that came up, of course, uh, and also I think Jan explained it very well uh, in the German context. So even when, uh, when there is uh, much more support for more defense cooperation in the EU context, and definitely in the Netherlands, I think you can, you can witness this, uh, and Brexit probably had something to do with it. Uh, even if you can see that, there still is this sort of uh, nitty gritty, ugly reality of how how uh, will it be translated in politics? Mm -hmm. And the outcomes uh, in the political process can be very, very different from our neat schemes of uh, slow progress towards a goal. Uh, and I think Jana gave a couple of very good examples of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one more I would like to give myself. Um, in the EU, we, we pride ourselves on being different from the Americans. Uh, our military approach is different. We have the three Ds. We have diplomacy, military means, development aid, and we, we blend them in this wonderful mix that, that really helps countries like Afghanistan mm -hmm. become more stable, right? So I think this entire story, which I've been reading really for many, many years, 
um, uh, sort of lies on its back right now. How, I mean, what does the Afghanistan fiasco, what does it mean for, for our, one of our big problems, namely uh, the Sahel? Mm -hmm. uh, what concepts actually do work? Uh, and Jana also touched on this, and I think it's a very big question. Uh, maybe we, we will see more efforts to do something there, but with what, uh, what's, what's our working strategy at the moment after Afghanistan? So I think there are many sort of also practical issues uh, that, that uh, you know, need discussion more. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. thanks a lot, uh, Arnaud, for, for looking back on this discussion. And I think to come back to my colleague Thies Dams, who, liked, who can explain actually very well what a narrative is, one of the points he always makes it, it needs a hero and it needs a villain. Uh, and maybe this narrative that we are crafting in Europe, we will have one anyway, even if we don't have a conscious decision to have a narrative, there will be one. And the current narrative is that basically there's very few heroes and we ourselves are almost the villains. So we should stop making this narrative one of Europe can't do it, Europe is not able, Europe is too divided, because we almost start believing that uh, the narrative ourselves. Uh, and the reality on the ground, indeed, which doesn't reach people, is that Europe could do a lot more because the instruments are actually there. We don't need to do a massive new treaty or a, we, we need to make the things that we have actually work. And then to conclude it on out, I suppose that's what, what the lesson of this whole thing is. If you really want to do it, your politicians have to put their weight behind it. And Dick's point about this has to be at the European Council level, this has to be a chancellor doing it, a prime minister, people have to go out and actually put themselves out there. Uh, and only time will tell if they will do it. For now, the least uh, encouraging thing I heard, Jana, was the Dutchification of German politics. Uh, I wish you good luck in the, the coalition formation. Uh, I wish our own parties in the Netherlands here good luck in their own coalition talks. And I would like to conclude by thanking Arnaud, uh, Adasha, and our panelists for spending this time with us. And I'd like to thank you audience and my wonderful colleagues here in the room who've made all this technology possible for being with us this morning. Thank you very much and have a good day.